1956 was a big year for Pauli. Reina, in June of that year, uh, Rhinus and Cowens found Pauli's neutrino, which he had hypothesized some 26 years before. And also, in June of that year, Pauli received a preprint from two Chinese-American physicists, uh, Xian Yang and T.D. Lee, in which they suggested that parity might not be conserved um, in all of physics, particularly in the weak interactions, a class of interactions that uh, contains radioactivity, for example. Well, Pauli read the reprint, uh, a preprint carefully because he respected these two people and uh, chuckled and just put it in his desk drawer. But others took it more seriously. In January of 1957, it was six months afterwards, uh, uh, C.S. Wu led an experimental team which did the experiment that showed that indeed mirror symmetry is not preserved in the weak interactions. The New York Times called it the Chinese Revolution. Pauli must have been absolutely amazed at this. After all, just a few years before, he had been walking in his dreams with a Chinese woman, and they were both disturbed about mirror symmetry being violated. And here, a Chinese woman did the key experiment. What a wonderful example of Jungian synchronism, a very meaningful coincidence. Well, Pauli had met uh, Wu in 1941, um, and had, had described it to Jung as being a very beautiful and smart woman. Uh, in, they resumed their friendship, and in uh, January of 1957, Pauli wrote an interesting letter in which he said what really bothered him about the violation of mirror symmetry in physics is that it's violated only in the weak interactions. What does the strength of an interaction, what does the strength of an interaction have to do with the violation of a, of a conservation law? Lots of good questions, no answers, he said. Um, T.D. Lee recalled of, to me of that turbulent era that to many physicists, CPT was a fixed point around which all else turned. Pally confessed to uh, Fiertz that the downfall of parity caused him to behave irrationally for quite a while, and Fiertz attributed to his, uh, this, to, to Pally's mirror complex, uh, to which Pally admitted as such. He wrote to Jung about, uh, about his shock at the Chinese Revolution, and in the course of his discussions with Jung, he decided that mirror symmetry was absolutely important to maintain, because only if mirror symmetry were maintained could the conscious and the unconscious be mirror, mirror images of each other, and so only then could the self be, permit, be, be positioned between them, and one could achieve the ultimate form of enlightenment in Jungian psychology, individuation. And Pauli concluded that uh, as he had come to suspect, there were psychological reasons for him discovering uh, uh, CPT. Namely that mirror symmetry is an archetype. Uh, but archetypes are buried in the collective unconscious. How, how was it constellated uh, in Pauli, into Pauli's consciousness? And Pauli's discussion of this is a wonderful example of uh, Jungian synchronism, uh, Jungian psychology, uh, as well as containing elements that are indigenous to modern theories of creativity. It goes like this. Pauli worked in 1952, was working on problems of symmetry during the day. Um, he got stuck. He would, as all seasoned researchers should do, they stopped work. But they stopped work only consciously. The passionate, intense desire to solve a problem keeps it alive in the unconscious, in which case uh, energy surges could be generated to constellate the archetype of mirror symmetry where it bubbles up into consciousness as the double star algol. So, work on physics during the day energizes archetype. To Pauli, there was a kind of synchronicity because there are unconscious motives when one is involved in something. And so unconscious motives play a role in creative thinking. He believed that the relationship between physics and psychology is that of a mirror image, yet there was no longer any mirror symmetry. But Pauli claims that's no big deal, because physicists should have looked deeper into their psyche for a more profound mirror image, of a more profound reflections. And that's CPT symmetry, which is bigger, more grander than mere mirror reflections. Now, while Pauli was struggling with the ramifications of, uh, of loss of, of violation of parity, 
his old friend uh, Heisenberg passed through Zurich uh, to discuss with Pauli uh, his recent research uh, project, nothing less than a unified field theory of elementary particles that could produce their masses and coupling constants. This was uh, to be the culmination of his, uh, of his research life. Um, it was his passion, and Pauli up to then had been nothing but, but negative. Uh, Heisenberg's approach to physics was a helpful leather anything goes style, and it had worked in 1925 with his discovery of quantum mechanics, in 1927 with his discovery of the uncertainty principle, in 1932 with his uh, pioneering work on the form of a nuclear force or strong force, and during the 1930s uh, in his attempts to formulate a version of quantum electrodynamics free of infinities. Heisenberg had become entranced with the power of mathematics to understand the physical world, and in this work he was willing even to introduce an indefinite metric with negative probabilities. This enraged Pauli, who said that our friendship will stop if you don't stop this nonsense. To which Heisenberg replied, nature exists after all. I mean, Heisenberg was willing to throw rigor to the winds to invent his own mathematics. It didn't matter. For Pauli, rigor had to be maintained at every step in theorizing. And this, incidentally, was uh, why he missed out on several great discoveries. Well, what happened here in this instance is as it had been all through their relationship, Pauli offered Heisenberg a key, a key suggestion. And that was to look for nonlinear versions of the Dirac equation. Heisenberg went back to Göttingen, where his institute was, and uh, came up with, uh, as he put it, the simplest nonlinear extension of the Dirac equation. It's cubic in, in the fields, which uh, uh, could maintain uh, the various uh, symmetries, some of the symmetries that Pauli and Heisenberg wanted, such as isotopic spin symmetry. The quantized fields psi have very complicated symmetry properties uh, and are rigged up so that they can get rid of uh, certain of the difficulties associated with an indefinite metric. And a combination of these fields with an asymmetric or degenerate vacuum, Heisenberg and Pauli hoped, uh, this equation could generate the masses, the K schemes, and coupling constants of all elementary particles, in particular the fine structure constant, 1 over 137, which had always been their holy grail. Indeed, Heisenberg did initial calculations and, and calculated the fine structure constant as one, as 1 over 250. It should be 1 over 137, so this isn't bad. Pauli was hooked. It seemed as if the old days were back. The two giants of quantum theory once again were working together. They can solve anything. It's bound to turn out magnificently. This is powerful stuff, Pauli wrote to Heisenberg. Heisenberg recalled that never before or afterward have I seen Pauli so excited about, about physics. Indeed, uh, Heisenberg, too, was brimming with excitement because it seemed as if his platonic dream was on the verge of coming true. As he wrote to his sister-in-law, that these relationships that were emerging from, that should emerge from this equation, that these relationships display in all their mathematical abstraction an incredible degree of simplicity is a gift we can only accept humbly. Not even Plato could have believed them to be so beautiful, for these interrelationships cannot have been invented. They have been there since the creation of the world. Heisenberg was wonderfully quotable. The two men wrote up a preprint on which uh, Pauli was scheduled to speak in February 1958 in the United States. Now, for, for Pauli, their research was so fundamental that it had Jungian associations with it. Pauli always spoke about how different he was from Heisenberg, but he thought at this point in time, the two of them were gripped by the same archetype, that of reflection symmetry. And indeed, Pauli felt that every time he sat down on his desk to write equations, his hand was guided by, that, by the energized, uh, magnificent reflection symmetry of CPT, that is, by director reflector. He even dreamt about it, director Spiegler, he even dreamt about it. Uh, Pauli dreamt that he was, once had a dream that he was, he was in a room and two children appeared and he called out to his second wife, Franca, Franca, look, two children. This is Pauli's second wife, Franca, and that's the way Franca recalled Pauli proposed to her, now we married. 